Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our Noonday Bible study. We're going to open up with a word of prayer. We will be beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 1. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us to come together this day for Bible study. We thank you, Lord God, for our study in 1 Samuel. We thank you for the word that you have given unto us that is food for our souls. Thank you, Lord, because from your word, we have learned so much about who you are, but we still need your help to live life the way that you desire for us to live it. We thank you that we're not what we used to be, but Lord, we know that we're still not yet what we ought to be. Therefore, we ask that your word continue to have its perfect work in us and bless us, Lord God, to be obedient to the word, to grow, by the word, to understand and come to know you better, and to be more obedient unto you than what we have been in our past. Let every day be a step forward for all the hearers of this message. And we pray, Lord God, you would get the glory, the honor, and the praise from it all. Thank you for your mercy and your grace, without which we all would have perished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First Samuel chapter 15, and we're going to be beginning at verse number one. We'll say to everyone, welcome to our Bible study session for our noonday Bible study. Broadcasting here from home once again, and uh, going to pick up at first Samuel chapter 15. Now, this is a very important chapter, and it affords us an opportunity at an extremely good lesson. Uh, but once again, I'm not in a race to get through the word. I'm just going to take my time as we go along and uh, let the Holy Spirit have his way. Amen. Now, chapter 15 is a very important chapter for us in the life of Saul because chapter 15 concludes the account of Saul's decline. God chose him, made him king. But after that, Saul actually began to decline as king. The reason he began to decline was because of his disobedience to God's word, having little respect or regard for God's word and the way God said to do things. Uh, you remember last week, he went and offered the offering that the prophet Samuel was supposed to do. He feared and said, you know, well, Samuel's taking too long. Let me go ahead and do it. And he did it himself, but he was not the one God chose to make an offering and sacrifice unto him. It was supposed to be God's prophet. So Samuel had to come and tell Saul he had done wrong. God's not done with him yet, though. We're going to see in just a moment, Saul has one last chance that God gives him to get it right. And let's see what, Sa what, Sa what Saul, I'm sorry, does with that opportunity that God will give him. Amen. Beginning at, <coughs> excuse me, beginning at verse number one, Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Now, right there in verse number one, something vitally important is said. Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. I'll hear this from the NIV translation. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people, Israel. Okay? So Samuel is proclaiming his significance in Saul's life. I am the one God sent to anoint you. Remember, Saul tried to do what Samuel was supposed to do. And it failed because Saul was not the one anointed by God to do those things. 
We have so much of that that goes on today in churches where people say, you know what? I've seen what they've done. I can do that. There's nothing to it. I just got to remember what they said, do it in the order that they said it, and I can do it myself. The problem is you're forgetting about God's anointing. God chose Samuel to serve him as his prophet. We have people today that have just said, I can do it. There's nothing to it. But they haven't been chosen by God to do those things. And for so many now, it sounds right. It looked all right. They can do it. And they forget totally about God's way of doing things. Why? What did we forget? We went through the exact same motions. But you were not called. The calling is so important. Because the Bible tells us that he that is in hireling, when he sees the wolf coming, he's going to flee. But the one called by God will not run because that one knows they cannot run. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Let's keep reading. The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people over Israel. Now, therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. The prophet speaks to the people for God. Now, God has told Samuel what to do, what to say. Samuel has come to tell Saul what thus saith the Lord. Verse 2, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass, or the translations, donkey, okay? So what is God telling Saul to do? Samuel has told him, God wants you to go and utterly destroy. Now we know what that means, utterly destroy. But just in case there's any ambiguity anywhere that, that, that people don't understand, Samuel spells it out for us, okay? He said, go smite Amalek. That's the king. Utterly destroy all that they have. Houses, lands, whatever they have. Utterly destroy. Pots, plates. Utterly destroy all that they have, okay? Don't miss that. And spare them not. Do not spare anyone. But slay, kill, put to death, both man and woman, infant and suckling, children, even babies, put them to death. All that they have that is living, ox and sheep, camel and donkey or ass, they are all to be put to death. So when he says utterly destroy, leave nothing alive, leave, leave nothing intact, utterly destroy. So we get the picture that Samuel is painting for Saul. So let's see what happens. Verse four, Saul get, and Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tel Aim, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. Now when it says he came to a city of Amalek, this is a city outside of Amalek, but within the region and therefore claimed to be a part of Amalek's domain. So he came to the city, uh, to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. Verse six, Saul said unto the Kenites, go, depart, get ye down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. 
For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Now I'm going to stop there. I wanted to get to this point because now I can contrast the Kenites with the Amalekites. Why did God want to utterly destroy the Amalekites? Well, we were told that God remembered that which the king Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up out of Egypt. Now, we can go back and we can look at the Exodus from Egypt. And matter of fact, it's in Exodus chapter 17, where beginning at verse number eight, the Bible says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua obeyed. He did as Moses had, com had commanded him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, okay, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. He had held them up till he began to tire. Okay? His hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. So he sat there on. He sat down, but he kept his hands up in the air. And his hands were steady. I'm sorry, I, I skipped the part there. Let me go back. They, they put it under him and he sat there on. And Aaron and her stayed up his hands. In other words, it would be like one, I'm using a pen, for example, supporting the arm so that his hand is up in the air. And in that hand, he's holding the staff that was given him. And as long as his hand is up, Israel prevails. So they are supporting him and helping Israel to win the battle because as long as his hands are up, Israel prevails. That says a lot about the man of God, whether we fight against him or we support him. Those who would fight against him would not prevail. I want you to notice neither Aaron nor her said, Moses, you're tired. Take a break. Give me the staff and I will hold it up for you. And after you've had a chance to rest, you come back and you can hold it up again. If they had done that and Moses had submitted to them while they held their arms up, Amalek would have prevailed because God was not with Aaron nor her like he was with Moses. It was Moses' responsibility. Aaron and her did the right thing by supporting Moses. And they helped him to bear up by lifting his arms up so that his hands stayed up. He still held the staff. It had to be in his hands. His hands were the ones that had to be up. They supported him when he was weary in the course of the battle. I've seen it happen in too many churches where people, instead of supporting, want to take over and end up fighting against, ridiculing. They start name calling, but they're putting down the one that God sent to them. I'm using specific language. Yes, I am. God said, I will give you pastors and teachers after my own heart. He did not say, I will give you pastors and teachers and other folk to replace them. You're to listen to all of them. God never does that. One pastor one church. The moment you try to have more than one leader, it's like putting two roosters 
in the same coop. One's going to die. The roosters will fight to the death, but they will not have another rooster in their coop. That's out. Now they can have their own coop, but you can't have two roosters in the same coop. Same thing goes. You can't have two pastors in a church. You can't have two people to be leaders of the church in the same church. One. And the children of God should support that one. Helping out wherever they can as needed. He told them to assemble the, uh, the men to go out and fight against Amalek. He said he would be up on the hill and then he would have the staff in his hand. And as long as he held it up, they were winning. When he got tired and put his hands down, Amalek was winning. They saw what was happening. They saw what God was doing. And they immediately said, let us help him so that we may prevail. Catch what I'm saying. Too often you have people in church, they want a position. It's all about them. And when they get there, you know it's all about them and nobody else. That's the wrong mentality and that's the wrong person to have in any positions of leadership. They must have a mentality that respects why God allowed them to be president of this auxiliary, vice president, treasurer, secretary. They must have an understanding. And y'all know how I always approach it. It's not about I got to say so. It's about I have the responsibility. I'm held accountable. So that means folk ain't going to always agree with what you say. Folk ain't going to like you because of decisions you have to make. But you, especially when you're the pastor, have been called to walk that path. And you got to walk it, okay? So Saul gathered the people together, came to the city of Amalek, laid wait in the valley, told the Kenites, Look, y'all were nice to God's people when they were coming through the wilderness to the promised land. Y'all have an opportunity to get out and be spared because we're coming to destroy the Amalekites. And the Kenites heeded and got out. God never forgot what Amalek did to his people when they were in the wilderness. So, they were in the wilderness and they fought against God's people. God didn't bring them there to fight. God was leading them through to the promised land. Amalek could have sat there and let them pass through and everything would have been just fine. But no, he chose to attack them. And God didn't do anything right then and there. But God never forgot what Amalek did. And now God comes back to address it. Okay, you reap what you sow. You may not reap it the moment you sow it, but you will definitely reap what you have sown. So, the Kenites depart from the among, among the Amalekites. Now, you got to watch this. Here we go. Verse number seven. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. So he started the battle. When they tried to flee, he pursued them because remember what God said, utterly destroy, right? Now, watch what happens in verse eight. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Stop there. Did Saul do what God told him to do? No, he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. 
He did not kill it. Why would Saul disobey God? God said utterly destroy the Amalekites. That means king and everybody under him. Why wouldn't he do this? Remember the mistakes that Saul has already made? It was like a seed planted in him that germinated and began to grow. And that seed was actually a seed of rebellion. Watch this. Okay? Because it's going to get worse. Saul did not do what God told him to do. Now, his soldiers, his people, are following him, right? He took the king alive. It was something that kings did to kings they conquered. They brought them back alive and paraded the conquered king through their city so that they could appear to be, you know, I'm, look Look how good a king I am. Look what we have done. Here is thine enemy. And this is, was their leader. And they parade their leader through. It was kind of like a honor thing for the victor. Okay? Verse 9. But Saul and the people. Now, remember verse 8? And he, Saul, took Agag. 1. Verse 9. But Saul and the people, those who were following him, spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. So what happens there in verse number nine? What began as one with Saul spread to the people? Well, you know what? Let's not kill the king. As a matter of fact, why we got to kill these sheep? Some of these are good sheep. Let's take them for a spoil. Ox, fatlings, lambs, all that's good. Let me go back. And let me go back and read for you what God said. Go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, that includes Agag the king, infant and suckling, children, babies, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now let's go back down here to verse 9. They saw, but Saul and the people spared Agag, mistake, and the best of the sheep, he said to kill those too, and of the oxen, he said ox and sheep, and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. Now, who is the determiner of that which is good? It's not God. It's not Samuel. It's Saul and the people under him. In other words, man has become the judge of what is good. And what is not? That's a big problem. You know why? We have the exact same problem today in churches. Where man has become the decider of that which is good and that which is not. Never mind the word defines that which is good and that which is not. Why do we think we know better than God? That's the question. How in the world can we even conceive that we know better than God? That we, our judgment is better than God's judgment. No, 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 no. Our best judgments are totally off when compared with God. This problem still exists in the church today and causes so many church fights 
because the Bible says this, the man of God should want to follow God's word, but the people want to say otherwise. And let me tell you, it's, it's even worse ugh, in a family church. It's even worse in a family church. In, in, in seminary, we call those cat churches. And we were taught, don't get involved in them cat fights. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen cats actually fight. You think dog fights are bad? You need to watch a cat fight. To me, cats are way worse than dogs, okay? And I'm, I'm talking about your household cat pits when, when they go at it. It's far worse than when dogs go at it, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. But we're talking, don't get caught, don't, don't get in them family fights, okay? Because you will find out that family will stick together. In other words, they will turn on you. When the family is fighting, they will turn on you and deal with you and you're out, you're gone. And then they go back and finish their fight among themselves. But you've lost a church now. And you can't do what God put you. Well, if God put me there, he meant for me to stay there. He going to keep me there. God gave you some common sense too. I've had friends that have lost their churches behind family fights within family churches. I've seen the hurt it causes, the pain it causes. My first church was my family, cousins. And when they would get to arguing and everything, I would not get in the fight. But I would stay where I was supposed to be. And from there, I would preach and I would teach God's word. That's all. That's what he wanted me to do. He would take care of the fight. As long as he has a voice there in that family's house. I was the voice. They were my cousins fighting. And I had to stand there and preach and teach God's word. And sure enough, God took care of everything. But if I put the Bible aside, if I close my Bible and come out the pool pit, I'm going to get involved, then it, guess what? I'm going to lose. You know, they say blood is thicker than water. I'm going to lose, okay? So they became judges. Why why you say that, Pastor? Because they decided what was good and what should be destroyed. And it was based upon their estimation of the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatlings and the lambs, all is the best of it all. And all that was good, according to them. But everything that was vile and refuse, according to them, that they destroyed utterly. That is not what God told them to do. God said, utterly destroy it all. Verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, and here it is, verse 11. It repenteth me. In other words, I am grieved. I regret that I have set up Saul to be king. For he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. Now look what it did to the man of God. Samuel, why are you crying? You didn't, you didn't mess up. You didn't disobey God. Why are you crying? You didn't do nothing. But he cried all night long unto the Lord. He can't change what Saul has done. He cannot change the person Saul has become, the kind of leader Saul has become. Rather than keep God's commandment, Saul has said, you know what, people? Y'all are right. Let's spare the king. 
Y'all take the best of everything and, and, and we'll kill whatever else we don't like and then we'll go home. That's not what God told them to do. Okay? So God is greedy. If he regrets that he has set up Saul to be king because Saul is not the kind of king that the Lord wanted. Hmm. God have mercy. Verse 12, And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and is gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. So he made him a place where he could go and find refuge, a place where he could stay there at uh, Carmel, and he has gone on down to Gilgal. So verse 13, and Samuel came to Saul. So Samuel goes on down to Gilgal, where Saul is. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You hear what Saul says. He greets him. Blessed be the man of God. I have performed. I have done what God commanded me to do. And what does the man of God do? Watch this. As Samuel said, verse 14, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Samuel immediately confronts. Immediately confronts. I want to give you a vitally important clue a warning that you should pick up on when you're about to enter into trouble people today in church will tell you what they're going to do what they've done and then whatever they tell you they'll tell you this and don't tell the pastor nothing that's your warning we ain't going to let the pastor know. Don't nobody tell the pastor. I'm not talking about, well, we're going to surprise the pastor for his anniversary. I'm not talking about it. I'm saying folk have done something. Don't tell the pastor what we did because they already know. If Saul knew what kind of man Samuel was, Saul wouldn't have ran out there to greet him. Saul would have ran from him because Saul knew I didn't do, but look what he claimed. He said, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Right there in verse 13. That, that was Saul's words. And Samuel had to tell him, correct him. Then what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen? If you did it, what is this? Oh my goodness. Verse 15. Watch what Saul does. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best, the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. You ought to be pleased, Samuel. Come on, let's go sacrifice. God ought to be pleased. God is furious because they did not do what God commanded. God did not ask for a sacrifice. You know as well as I know, from the New Testament, God desires obedience more than sacrifice. Saul did not obey. Samuel has come to confront his sin and his error. Now, let me stop right here because, boy, there's, there's so much right here. Think back with me to Genesis in the Garden of Eden. What did Satan say when he came in the form of the serpent? What did he say to Eve? Not to Adam. He didn't say it to Adam. He said it to Eve. What did he say to Eve? He said, yea, hath God said? And then he said, thou shalt not surely die. Goes directly against it. In other words, Eve, stop and think for yourself. And then he goes 
and goes directly against what God said. God said, for in the day you eat of it, that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And what did the serpent say? Yea, hath God said, and then he said, you shall not surely die. You have the exact same thing here. Samuel told them what to do. They got there. They're doing what he said. But the people, Saul and the people, because Saul was king, decided to spare Agag, king of the, of the Amalekites, and they decided to spare the best of the sheep, of the oxen, the lambs, the fatling, when God told them to utterly destroy it all. What Saul should have done was said, no, you will not spare anything, but utterly destroy everything. Obey the commandment God has given you. I point this out because it's our problem still to this day. And that battle is fought and waged over and over again in our hearts every single day. To obey him, but I want. To obey him, but I need. Obey him. What I need to do is obey him. What I want is insignificant compared to my need to obey him. Unless my want is also to obey him. But I should never reverse it. I want to obey him, but I need this other thing. That's how we play it out in our hearts a lot of times. And we sin because we don't obey him and we do not keep his commandment. Remember what he said to the woman taken in adultery? Go and sin no more. Those same words should have been spoken in our heart when we got saved. Go and sin no more. And yet we have gone and we have sinned all the more. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is an unrighteous, no, not one. Can't nobody, I ain't done no sin ever since I gave my life to Christ. You just did one because you're lying. And it's not based on what I think is sin and what I don't think is sin. It's based on God's word, his commandment. Here we are living in a society today where instead of doing what we should do, witnessing to the lost, we think, we think it's better to be accepting of the lost ways. So now you have Christians saying, I don't have no problem with the LGBTQ community. I don't have no problem with uh, the adulterer, the adulteress. I don't have no problem with the liar. I don't have no problem with all these folk that sin. Let's just love one another. God is a God of love and we're supposed to just love one another. You're part right, but you're also very wrong. Because yes, we are to love one another but you are to hate the sin and love the sinner. And we are not capable of distinguishing the two. We are more apt to say, I hate all this. I hate the ones that are living this way because the Bible says this is how we should live and they're living their own way. The Bible says the way they're living is a sin and they continue to live in sin. They want us to be accepting of their sinful ways and and and. We just like, uh, uh the easiest way is hate it all. Get rid of it all. Now, nah, we don't have to be bothered with it or anything. We live it righteously. No, we're not. What if that's your child? You still love your child, but you cannot love their way. You cannot agree with it. You cannot walk in it. You, you will not encourage it. You will remind with every opportunity. And I don't mean 
the moment you see them, you heathen you, they're not going to listen to you and your words will never get into their heart. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. Christ loves us, but he does not love our sin. We have to do the same thing. When he's loving us to a right way of life, we have to love them to the right way of life. And the only example we have to follow is that of Christ. We got to learn to love the way he loved. The woman taken in adultery, look at how he freed her. But he did not say to her, it's all right, you're going to be saved. Go ahead and live your life the way you want to live it. He said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, oh, strive for it. Try your best. He said, go and sin no more. And we know we have all transgressed his commandments. But so nobody feels let down and you know, I've got this heavy weight upon me now of sin. If we confess our sin, 1 John 1 and 9, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to confess it. We have to own it and acknowledge it to God. I have sinned. This is what I have done. Confess it. He is faithful and just. Forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is for the believer, not the non-believer. Because he who comes to God must first believe that he is. Ah, can't stress that enough. It's not I went to church, now my sins are forgiven. Your sins are not forgiven just because you went and sat in church one Sunday. You must be born again. And once you're born again, you cannot continue to walk in sin. It will bother you to no end. You will have to change your ways. I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I know. None of us are yet what we ought to be, but all of us can thank God we're not what we used to be. Amen? Whew, I tell you, I couldn't wait to get to this part. Verse 16, then Samuel said to Saul, stay, okay? And I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, say on. Saul just does not know what's coming his way, okay? He just, he's clueless, y'all. He does not know. And say, okay, and Samuel said, verse 17, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. Saul would have to, yeah, he did. And the Lord sent thee, verse 18, on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed, utterly destroyed. Verse 19, Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord. There it is. Samuel must confront Saul and make him see his error. And he does that by repeating God's commandment to him and then showing him that he did not do what God said do. Verse 20, and Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. I've done it. He's still, I have done it. But look what he says next. But the people took up the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. He confesses it, which should have been utterly destroyed. To sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, God, thy God in Gilgal. He's trying to point him at, look, we're going to sacrifice it to God. 
that that's that ought to make it all right, shouldn't it? It's not gonna make it all right. Verse 22, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. And then Saul calls Samuel out for rebellion. This is rebellion. The other Sunday when Reverend Reed was preaching about the children and raising them up, talking about King David, how though he was there, he did not discipline his children. And it caused the seed of rebellion. And Reverend Reed was saying, you don't whip your child when that child makes a mistake. But when that child rebels against you, that's when you have to do something. He says here, verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. Notice. He, he uses stronger language because he didn't say it. Said, because thou hast disobeyed the word of the Lord. He said, because thou hast rejected. That's what rebellion does. That's what stubbornness seeks to do. Rebellion rejects. Hear me well. Bring it back to the church. Rebellion rejects. The pastor gets up and says, the Lord has told me to. Now, hear me well when I say this. If the pastor is saying the Lord has told me and the Lord ain't told him, God will deal with the pastor. Trust me, I've seen it happen. But if God did tell the pastor and the congregation or any part thereof says, the Lord, I ain't going to do it. We ain't going to do that. We're not going to do that. God ain't told him that and God did. There lies the spirit of rebellion. Rebellion will formulate a plan. Rebellion will try to force it to a vote among the people. Rebellion seeks to undo or else not do what God wants done. That's You have it right there. Samuel told him, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It has the exact same consequence. What are you supposed to do to the, to the one that practices witchcraft? Kill him. Put him to death. Stone him to death. That's what they did in the Old Testament. Do not let them live. Utterly destroy them. Utterly destroy the sin. Ah, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. There you have it. Saul has been rejected from being king. Now watch what happens. Verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Woo, sounds like a good confession, doesn't it? Start is real good. Verse 25. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin. Samuel can't do that. Only God can forgive sin. Samuel, he's saying to Samuel, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Now, what Samuel is being asked to do there, you got to see through this cloud that Saul has spewed forth. It's not that he really wants to go and worship the Lord. It's really that he wants Samuel to go with him so that it will appear to the people that he and Samuel are still together. When in reality, Samuel has had to separate himself from Saul too. Because God has separated himself from Saul. So verse 26. 
And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee. Samuel was not told to, but Samuel can see through what Saul is trying to do. I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. I'm not going with you to pretend that you are still king. I must depart and leave you to yourself. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now. When you got a pastor that will do what Samuel has done, you got a good pastor. He going to take some flack for it from the church this day, in this day and age. Oh, you supposed to forgive them for everything that they have done. Yes, I have to forgive my brother when he does me wrong. If I don't forgive him, it hurts me, not him. I have to forgive him for my well-being. But God will deal with my brother. What do you think let the Lord fight your battles means? Don't you go fight it. Don't you go get him. But God would tell Samuel what to do, just like he, through Samuel, would tell Saul what to do. It was Saul who said, don't do it. And as king, he let the people disobey, so he bears the responsibility. Stop giving your pastors hard times. I'm saying this for anyone who might be watching this. Stop giving your pastors hard time when they are obeying what God says for them to do. If, they, you, if you can read in the Bible and see here it is, this applies exactly, and my pastor is standing on God's word, support him. You're going to get talked about too. People are going to tell you you're crazy and all that ugly stuff they say about the pastor. They'll start to say it about you too. But trust me, in the end, you will come forth as pure gold. Don't give in. A lot of pastors give in today because they're afraid of losing their churches. They give in to the will of the people. That's why so many of these constitutions that some churches have, the way the congregation understands it is they have the say so. And they forget. It's God, congregation, pastor. Not one member of the congregation, not a chosen spokesperson for the congregation, the congregation itself pastor and then all the auxiliaries you're under the pastor but the congregation voted him in and they can vote him out that's why you see god congregation pastor but if one member you know i don't like him no more because of what he did to me what he said to me i don't like how he talked to me do they know what you did that ain't important. What's important is what he did, and it wasn't right. They don't want you to know what they did. I didn't do nothing wrong. They don't want you to know what they did. They just want you to be angry with them so that what they want done can be done. That's not how this thing works, okay? All right. So Saul is not going to get, be able to get Samuel to go with him. He, Samuel has rejected that. And verse 27, and Samuel turned about to go away. And I'm sorry, and as Samuel turned about to go away, he, Saul, laid, hand, laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent, tore it. And look what verse 28 says. And Samuel said unto him, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Better at obeying God. Better at fearing God. Y'all, there's always somebody better than any one of us. I don't care what accolades members of Morning Star may give me. There are better pastors out there than me. I'm the one God chose and placed for this time to do this thing. But there's going to come another after me. I'm going to have to stop right there for today. I will pick up on this again on next week. 
Um, let us bow our heads for a closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us on this day during our noonday Bible study. We ask, Lord God, let what we have heard and learned this day resonate within our hearts. Bless us to go forward and to be better Christians for you. In our churches, bless us to listen to you and to do the work that you give us give us to do. Moreover, we ask you to bless the pastors that are standing on the word of God that are striving to do those things which thus saith the Lord. Speak to our pastors, Lord. Give them the vision, give them the understanding and bless them to relay it all to us in a way that we are able to understand. And Father, we pray you will receive all the glory, the honor and the praise for all that is done. Bless the Morning Star Missionary Baptist Church and bless everyone under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray and all the saints said, Amen. God bless your heart. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.